All right, church, we, uh, we are continuing our series on loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, strength, and soul. Um, and this morning, we're, we're going to be in the last part of our series, uh, this morning and next week, what it means to love God with your soul. Uh, this is talking about developing the inner life of spiritual formation. And we've looked at each of these areas of spiritual formation um, that we can experience God through our head, through our, our knowledge, uh, and we can experience God through our heart our, uh, or our senses. And, and then we, we, can, we can know there are things about God that are known, and then there are things about God that are unknowable or hidden. So the, this kind of creates uh, four uh, quadrants of spiritual formation. And, and when, what we're trying to look at is what does it mean to be whole in spiritual formation, to, be, uh, to find balance in our lives between uh, the areas that we naturally move into with our spiritual life and areas that we need to develop more. Uh, and we've been looking at the life of Jesus and, and its scripture uh, and show where it shows the different areas of spiritual formation, these th four different areas of spiritual formation throughout Scripture. And so uh, you're going to find yourself more naturally in one area than the others. And even as a, as a church tradition, we find ourselves more uh, in the mind spirituality, uh, where, where we, we want to know God, what we can know about God uh, in cognitive ways with our mind. And so we search Scripture uh, we we want to make sure and have right doctrine, and we want good theology, and that that is a uh, that is a good spirituality. But it it needs balancing with the other areas of spiritual formation, and so we find ourselves in different areas uh, more naturally. Some of you are more kingdom minded. You're more in the mindset of strength, where it's like, okay, I know what, I know what the Bible says, but let's put it into practice, and and those come into tension sometimes, where. Uh, we need people to call us into action and not just into knowledge. Uh, but then you go down into the uh, what we know about God with our senses or our heart, and we find ourselves uh, in transformation through experiences of relationship with God. And so we find ourselves in the heart quadrant. Um, we, we, we like good music that moves us. We want an inspirational a testimonial from someone's walk with God. And, uh, and that kind of takes us into the heart spirituality. This morning, we want to look at um, an area that is probably more foreign to a lot of us. Uh, this is an area that needs to cult that we need to cultivate more uh, because it stands opposite or not opposite as in contrast, but it's, it's on the other end of the spectrum from where a lot of us gravitate towards in the mind spirituality. We're going to look at the soul. And this is a, how do you develop um, the area of your spiritual life where you search after God with all of your senses, but you're searching after a God that can be unknown, uh, a God that's bigger than you can even imagine. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about what does it mean for God to be unknown uh, and bigger than you can imagine? And I love asking this question to groups and you can't really respond right now. Um, so I'm just going to kind of get you to respond in your head, but you know, how big is God? Think about that. How, how big is he? Okay, I'll tell you, he's bigger than that. Because whatever you're imagining, God is bigger. Uh, and think about it this way. You are a finite being trying to contemplate, trying to think about the God who created the mind. Uh, you are a created being trying to contemplate the creator. So God is bigger. Can you even describe God? Because every description you find in scripture of God, even the words that God uses to describe himself, that falls short of who God actually is because God is bigger than your understanding. And so God, but God tries to relate with, to us uh, through our understanding. So one of the descriptions we go to often is God said, uh, you know, God is love. Uh, but that really depends on your experience and understanding of love. Because even if you've experienced love in the greatest forms in this life, God is bigger than that. And so imagine a, a God who, 
is unfathomable in the love that he possesses. God is bigger than the love you can experience. Uh, your understanding of love is not even big enough to fathom that God is love. And so, you know, we all throughout scripture, we find uh, scriptures like Psalm 42, where it talks about as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longs for you. And this one verse in, in verse seven says, deep calls to deep. Uh, during worship, during these intense times of worship, uh, have you ever had a longing for God? Um, and that longing, you know, may even come out of a, uh, you're just tired of artificial experiences that, you know, you may go visit a church sometime that is doing it, they're doing their best to cultivate an experience for you to, uh, to connect with God. And sometimes when you're when you're forcing an experience of connection to God, uh, it becomes a little artificial and you find yourself saying, isn't, isn't God more than this? Um, do you ever hear teaching that's just shallow and you just want to go deeper into knowing God? Uh, sometimes uh, I find myself frustrated that, you know, devotional books sometimes are just fluff and, and I want something that's deeper than the fluff that sometimes these books give. But even, even being a, a, a student of theology, someone who studies God, uh, I've done that for, oh man, a long time now, almost 18 years of studying theology. It can sometimes come up shallow because I'm just studying about God and it, it, pulls me into a deeper longing for actually knowing God. And I, I see the faith of so many in scripture and I hear about the faith of so many throughout, throughout uh, church history. And I see the faith of others in the church. And I, I think, man, when Paul says, I want to know Christ, to know the power of the resurrection, I, I think, man, this is the guy who wrote much of the New Testament and he wants to know Christ. And so there, there's something deeper that we're, we're called into. And it reminds me, uh, as I was preparing this, it reminded me of a book called Yawning at, Tar at Tigers. And the, the premise of this book, this is a good one to kind of uh, read, to, to kind of kick you into wanting to know God, that he, he uses this imagery of you go to a zoo, and he, I think he's talking about his kid. They're at the zoo, and, and they, they go to the tiger section and, uh, of the zoo. And his kid just is bored and he yawns there's this tiger in front of him that's not really doing anything and there's nothing terrifying about the tiger because the tiger is uh, entrapped in a zoo and so he finds himself kind of bored with the tigers and sometimes what we do with god is we we try to tame god box him in and domesticate him and I'm reminded of uh, Chronicles of Narnia, where they talk about, is, is Aslan dangerous? And they say, well, yeah, yes, he's dangerous, but he's good. And so, you know, do you allow God to be big? Do you allow God to be um, bigger than you, than you can imagine? Do you allow God to be powerful? Do you allow God to to be the God he is, or do you, do you want God to be the God you want? And so do you find yourself yawning at church? Um, or do you allow worship to be a place where you actually encounter the glory of God? And so this is kind of what I want to talk about. How do you cultivate this in your own spiritual life? That when you seek a relationship with a God who is unknowable, um, this is, you begin focusing on your interior life, what's going on in the inside. Uh, this is uh, a time and space for contemplation where you actually start to explore the mysteries of God. And this is where you meditate on scripture, where you don't just study it. You don't just study the context and you study the, um, the first century world or the world that uh, the Bible is written in. But this is where you meditate on scripture. Uh, where you, you know, the psalmist in Psalm 1 says, I, I delight in your law and I meditate it day and night. And Psalm 119, the whole psalm, the whole, the longest psalm in the Bible 
is is all about just meditating and delighting in God's word. Uh, but meditation brings you into interaction with scripture, not just reading scripture. And so this is where you seek out inner peace. Um, that while the world may be chaos around you, you know that your soul has rest in God. And so you, you seek out inner peace. Um, it's a, really a relationship of surrender that every time you encounter the presence of God, you, you learn and re- continue to learn the things that you need to give up. And so it's a relationship of surrendering to God where you, you constantly hand God um, your idols and the things that hold you back from a deeper relationship with God. So it's a continual surrender. Uh, your prayer time uh, leads you to union with God. But even though you can't fathom the mysteries of God, you find yourself more and more united with God. And one thing that I always try to um, keep in mind is that we always keep the mystery of God on the table. That anytime we try to uh, talk about God, we have to be reminded that God is bigger than we can imagine. And so uh, in this search of uh, developing this area of spirituality in your life, always keep the mystery of God on the table, that, um, that God is, is bigger than you can ever grasp. And, you know, so in Isaiah 55, verse 8, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. And, and God is, you know, constantly reminding the prophets, you just, you don't, you don't get it and you won't, but just trust me. And it, it's almost as though God reaches out his hand and says, just take the next step. You can't see where your foot's going to land, but I will guide it. And so this relationship of surrender takes you into an inner peace so that you can take the next step. Um, a guy named St. John of the Cross um, wrote in a, a book, a, a reflection called uh, Dark Night of the Soul. He, he talks about God, give me faith to take the next step. Uh, and this is, a, this is the kind of faith that is, you know, when you truly want to see, you close your eyes tighter because it's God who will actually reveal in us all that we need in this life. And so in in this type of spiritual formation of the soul, your Bible study focuses uh, more on the relational passages in Scripture. Um, You focus on passages dealing with the mystery of God. Uh, You've got lots of passages where, where God is just doing things that don't make sense. And, and you, you kind of step into more of a passive reception of scripture rather than an active taking of scripture. So Bible study that we do in the mind or with the mind is more of an active uh, engagement in scripture. This is more passive where you, you allow scripture to take you into a place of listening. This is um, where we do dwelling in the word. A group of us on Monday mornings have been dwelling in the word together. And every Sunday uh, during the pandemic, we've had a time of dwelling in the word together where I've been trying to encourage you to listen to what God is speaking to you through scripture. Um, This is where we sit in the presence of God and allow scripture to, to speak to us, to our inner being, to convict us and bring us into places of transformation. And so we seek God's presence and mystery in Scripture. Um, But this is also, uh, when we talk about the spiritual formation of the soul, there's three things that that we really need to cultivate. And these are three things that are really hard for us, or at least two of these are really hard for us uh, in in our tradition and and really in a lot of churches in in the Western world. Uh, The three areas are solitude, silence, and prayer. And I'm going to talk about prayer a little bit differently, but I want to unpack each of these that to develop the spiritually formative practices of the soul, to form the soul spiritually, um, you got to have silence, uh, solitude, silence, and prayer. So let's look at each of these. Uh, Now, if you take this, I need to give a disclaimer. If you take these to excess, if you take them to their extreme, uh, you go into quietism, you go into... um, basically an individual relationship with God that has little to no impact on the rest of the world. And, and that's where you go into bad places with this. And so uh, I think about hermits who have completely removed themselves from the world 
to pursue um, the mystic life. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is uh, how do you develop a relationship with God and the mystery of God in a way that um, then betters the kingdom of God. And so next week, we're actually going to look more at how this type of spirituality betters the church as we live in community together. You'll see some of that this morning. So first, we go into solitude. Um, and what is solitude? Solitude is, uh, this is something I need drastically in my life. Solitude, uh, I want to be around people. Uh, and when I want to be around people, I find myself needing to perform, needing to be the person that other people need me to be or want me to be. And solitude actually uh, kills that part of me to where I can be in the presence of God and allow God to shape who I am. And so we enter into solitude uh, to find our presence with God. Now, solitude is different than loneliness um, because uh, some people may be thinking, oh, well, yeah, I'm by myself all the time and I'm lonely. Well, that's different than solitude. Solitude has intentionality behind it. Loneliness is just absence of people. And so I wanna, there's a couple quotes I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna give to talk about solitude that I think are really good. A guy named Paul Tillich said, language has created the word loneliness to express the pain of being alone and the word solitude to express the glory of being alone. And so solitude is something we enter into uh, to then come out of it and be a better person for those around us. Uh, Thomas Merton, uh, one of the great writers of spiritual formation uh, of the last generation, says that true solitude is the home of the person. False solitude is the, ref is the refuge of the individualist. You go into the desert not to escape other men, but in order to find them in God. The more I become identified with God, the more I will be identified with all the others who are identified with him. The ultimate perfection of the con contemplative life is not a heaven of separate individuals, each one viewing his own private uh, intuition of God, but instead... It is a sea of love which flows through the one body of all the elect. And what Thomas Merton is saying here is you enter into the wilderness not to escape humanity, but to connect with God in a way that you see humanity more clearly. And so then when you, when you leave solitude to go be with people, you see them more so as God sees them. And that brings us into a greater unity of the one body. Uh, Henry Nouwen in the book, The Way of the Heart, which I highly recommend reading, he says, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside time to be with God and listen to him. Uh, when I ran across this quote uh, in the book, The Way of the Heart, it challenged me to my core because I spend most of my walk with Christ being with others. And we need to be with others. We need the fellowship. That, I'm not saying we don't need that, but we often find ourselves in conflict with people because we failed to go spend time with God uh, to see people more clearly. And when we enter into solitude, um, we have a secure sense of who we are as God's children. We have a secure sense of who we're called to be as God's church. And so we offer that back to the church. Uh, as we live in harmony together. We'll talk more about that next week. So solitude actually leads us into a place of silence. Uh, and as a person who loves to talk, as you all know, and talk way too much, uh, I desperately need silence in my life because I can tell God all kinds of stuff about him. But when I constantly tell God who he is, I fail to listen to God and how he's going to reveal who he is to me. And so I need to enter into times of silence so that my solitude uh, is filled with God's voice. And so silence is the most challenging of the spiritual disciplines. We love to talk. Uh, we are busy, wordy, and heady in our tradition. Um, and, and not just, you know, churches of Christ, but, but a lot of the Protestant traditions, a lot of the evangelical 
uh, traditions, we're, we're really big on Bible study. We're really big on knowing God with our mind. And that's a good thing, but it needs to be balanced with slowing down and listening to God. So again, I'm not saying any of this stuff to negate the others, but to say, how do we bring them into a healthy tension and partnership? And how do we um, help each other enter into greater times of silence so that we hear God? And we don't just read scripture hearing ourselves uh, recite the things that we already know, but we continue to listen to God through scripture. Adele Calhoun, uh, on this is in her book, The Spiritual Discipline Handbook, she says that silence is time to rest in God. Lean into God, trusting that being with him is silence. Uh, in silence will loosen your rootedness in the world and plant you by streams of living water. It can form your life, even if it doesn't solve all the problems of your life. That what she's saying is when you take time to be silent, um, you're actually going to be uprooted from all the wants and desires of this world. That when you seek the presence of God and seek the voice of God, all of the things that, that draw you into um, the way of the world, the way that the world calls you to live will actually uproot you and continue to place you back in your rootedness in God. That's where Jesus says, abide in me. Be connect if you're going to be a fruitful vine, you need to be connected. And so what are you doing to connect yourself in the presence of God. Well, one of the ways we have to do that is to slow down long enough to listen. So uh, here's another quote by a woman named Ruth Haley Barton. She says, we are starved for mystery. To know this God as one who is totally other and to experience reverence in his presence. We are starved for intimacy to see and feel and know God in the very cells of our being. We are star starved for rest, to know God beyond what we can do for him. We are starved for quiet, to hear the sound of sheer silence. That is the presence of God himself. We, we spend a lot of time in the strength spirituality, saying here's, here's what we do for God. Or we spend time in the, the heart spirituality saying, oh, it's, it's about experiencing relationship with God. Or we spend time in the mind quadrant telling God all the things we know and love about him. But we, we desperately need intimacy that comes through silence and quiet contemplation. So the, the myth of our culture and society is that we need to always be busy and therefore always be productive. And so I want to challenge, uh, I want to challenge this a little bit that being alone and doing nothing, uh, we often in our society, we, we deem that to be lazy, antisocial, and unproductive. And so here's the challenge. Put nothing on your calendar. Um, in my, in one of my youth groups years ago, um, Jessica Mitchell will remember this up in Statesville. I, for an entire summer, we put nothing on the calendar once a week, and the youth group came together and did nothing. And I remember, and what we did with that was we we did dwelling in the word that I, I told them to go spend, I think, 30 minutes to an hour. I can't remember which. Uh, they're teenagers, and I, I encouraged them to go spend time in silence with God. And then we came back together and talked about it. And I remember some of the parents telling me, said, I wish I had time for nothing. And I and my thought was, then you desperately need it. Uh, we we desperately need time for nothing to just waste time with God. And I'm preaching to myself here. Uh, I'm way too busy. And so the busy parts of my life will have, will be more fruitful if I actually schedule out time of nothing with God. And so what does that look like? Maybe five minutes a day. What if you started your day in just the silent presence of God, how would the rest of your day look? What if you took an hour a week? Just sometime during your week, you set aside an hour to just be in the presence of God, to abide in him, to just be in his love, knowing that you are a, a daughter or a son of God and just resting in that peace. Uh, what if you took a whole day, you know, once a month? Or 
uh, you know, took one weekend every six months and just said, I'm going to go on a retreat where I do nothing but be in the presence of God. Um, that would, that would be life changing. It would reshape all the things you do. And we're going to talk, we're going to look at this from the Bible perspective here in a minute. Um, Cause I promise we will get to scripture. So silence and solitude, when they work together, uh, this is a muscle that needs developing in our lives because the reality is we're not wired for this. You have to work at it. So start small. If it just takes 30 seconds of just being quiet, add 30 more to that, build on it. It's a muscle that has to be developed. Um, in, in developing this muscle, you'll, you'll find yourself more sane. Um, in a world of chaos. You'll make better decisions. You'll be at peace amongst the chaos of the world. Uh, you'll know the purpose, that you'll know what your purpose is in this life if you spend more time in silence and solitude. And what I mean by this is, uh, I know that in my life, when I find myself uh, angry on a regular basis, when I find myself feeling chaotic, when I feel myself um, when I find myself feeling more overwhelmed by the things of the world, one of the first things I check is how's my, how's my discipline of spending time with God? And almost always, I can tell you, it means I've, I've cut that part of my life out because when life gets busy, the first thing to go is our prayer life. And so prayer, uh, I want to challenge a little bit of our, our notion of prayer that sometimes we've thought of prayer too narrowly, that when we think about prayer alongside silence and solitude, um, prayer is first and foremost being attentive to the presence of God. That we're not just, this is not just a, okay, let's give God our list and then say goodbye as if he's a vending machine that then pours out blessings. Um, Prayer is relational. Prayer is conversational. So start your times of prayer recognizing the presence of God with you, around you, and specifically in you through the Holy Spirit. God is not distant off in the clouds somewhere. He is with you in the Holy Spirit. Um, begin prayer with silence and listening. Offer, and then offer your concerns to God. And then sit and listen to what God may be revealing to you. Because if you sit and listen long enough, uh, God may start to speak to you. You may start to hear what God is telling you and guiding this time of prayer. Uh, use scripture to pray. You know, pray with scripture. When you do this, you allow God the first word in your time of prayer through what he says. And so by, and this is what we do when we dwell in the word, that we actually begin we begin our time with God by giving him the first word rather than us telling him what's going on. So we're listening to scripture and then entering into dialogue with God. So what's the biblical witness for the spirituality of the soul? Let's kind of, I'm going to hit some highlights throughout the Bible, and then we're going to look at the life of Jesus as we wrap up this morning. I'm just going to read these off. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. <laughs> I think, I think of you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night and I, that I may meditate upon thy promise. Uh, even the old priest Eli knew how to listen to God and he helped the young boy Samuel know the word of the Lord uh, in 1 Samuel 3. He tells him, you know, go and just say, here I am, speak. Elijah spent many days and, and night in the wilderness, learning to discern the still small voice of Yahweh in 1 Kings 19. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and heard the voice, heard his voice saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And it's actually during this time of prayer that Isaiah was taken into the presence of the Lord that he found cleansing. And it's in that time of cleansing in Isaiah 6 where the, the angel takes the, the coal and, and places it on his lips. It's out of that cleansing and figuring out and finding out that he is a child of God 
that he then had confidence to actually go and carry the message of God. And Jeremiah discovered the word of God to be a burning fire shut up in my bones. So here's the example of Jesus for us. As Elliot read earlier, Jesus retreats to the wilderness in Luke chapter 4. And what, what's going on in the wilderness? This is where he goes to get tested. Uh, he spent 40 days fasting. And so we often think of Jesus as being really weak at this moment, but that's because we don't talk enough about fasting. Jesus at this moment has spent 40 days intensely and intently focusing on his relationship with the Father. He's just been told at his baptism, you are my son with whom I'm well pleased. And it seems as though he then goes to the wilderness to wrestle with what that identity means. And so what does it look like for us to, to wrestle with our, our sonship or the fact that we are a daughter of the father? Um, how does that identity shape how we view the rest of the world and how we view our interactions with the world? Uh, that what this did for Jesus is it solidified his identity as son. Uh, we got to remember that in Hebrews um, in chapter 2 and 4, he talks about Jesus became like us in every way. And so we have to question, did Jesus have to learn his identity in the same way that we did? That when, when God looked at him and said, you are my son with whom I well pleased, that that affirmed his identity in him. That, that's a longer conversation to talk about. But, but what does it mean that Jesus learned relationship? I mean, Luke talks all about how he had to grow in wisdom and stature. So this solidified his identity as son. And that's the very thing that Satan challenges Jesus with is, especially in Matthew, he says, if you are the son of God, do these things. And so he challenges his identity. But through fasting and prayer and solitude and silence, Jesus spends time in the wilderness with God. And so when Satan attacks him, when Satan tempts him, he knows who he is as the son of God. Uh, it, it is spending time in sol silence and solitude with God that gives him proper nourishment for his spiritual battle. You know, we, we focus on the fact that he's been without bread. He's been without food all this time, but he's been feeding his spirit through fasting. Uh, and so what does it mean to spend time developing the spirituality of the soul to prepare yourself for spiritual battle? Uh, he also used scripture, um, by the way, because he actually knew scripture. So there, there's a mind quadrant there as well. Uh, but his time in the wilderness also kept him focused on his purpose, that Satan actually gives him really easy ways uh, to accomplish his goals as the Messiah. But he knew that his purpose was bigger than simply getting everybody's attention or having everybody bow down to him. And so uh, this time of silence and solitude in the wilderness helped him stay focused on his purpose. And we actually see this lived out um, in the rest of Jesus' ministry as he often withdrew to lonely places to pray. And so, you know, Luke gives us an example here in chapter 4. Uh, we go to verse 42. Uh, it says, let me read this for us real quick. It says, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. And that tends to imply that he's out to pray. And he's not just disconnecting because he's tired of people, but he's disconnecting from people to reconnect with God and then to go back and be with people. But this actually helped him along the way. It says, uh, he went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news to the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. And what's crazy about this is Jesus had really good ministry right in front of him. But because he was going off to reconnect with the Father, he was constantly reminded of what his purpose was and didn't get sidetracked by simply doing good ministry, but he stayed focused on his pur purpose. That What Luke 4 actually shows us is he said no to good ministry. He said no to hurting people because his purpose was bigger. And 
it's hard for us to say no, because as soon as we say no to good ministry, we feel like we're not being Christ-like. But if we're doing it through discernment, if we're doing it to say, okay, what is our actual purpose here? Then saying no to good ministry might actually be more Christ-like because we're able to more intently focus on what God has called us to. And in chapter 5, verse, verse 16, um, it just gives us that example again of, you know, he's been he doing this healing ministry, but he often went off to lonely places and prayed. In chapter 6, verse 12, um, it says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he designated as apostles. And so what we learn from these passages is it keeps his focus on his purpose. Um, and he also, it provides discernment for big decisions. That before choosing the 12 who are going to go and change the world, well, 11 of them, you know, because Judas. Uh, but before going to change, you know, choose these 12, he spends all night in conversation with God, discerning who he needed, needed to choose. So what are we doing when we need to make big decisions as a church? What are we doing to discern the will of God during these times? And so that's, that's true for you in, in your life as well, that when you follow the example of Jesus, when you have big decisions to make, are you just you know, weighing the pros and cons or do you step into the presence of God and listen for his direction? We're going to look at, you know, I want to challenge you and encourage you to really um, develop this in your life. But next week, we're going to talk about when you develop this in your life, how does that actually better the community of God? Because everything we do in our spiritual formation is for the betterment of the kingdom. And so you're not just doing this for your own per personal fulfillment, but, but so that you can make the faith community, the, the church, better. And so I want to share a couple of resources uh, for spirituality of the soul um, so you can dig deeper into this for yourself. And if you want to learn more about this, um, I did the series on spiritual formation. Uh, you can find it on YouTube if you just go, if you just search No to Church on YouTube. There's a whole section on spiritual formation. We did a class on it. Uh, not too long ago, and, and we're going to provide that class a few more times. But here's some resources for the spirituality of the soul. Uh, I highly recommend Henry Nouwen's The Way of the Heart. He looks at uh, the desert spirituality of the you know, fourth century and the desert fathers and mothers uh, who who helped develop the uh, the spiritual life of the church. Um, and it's it's not that those started in the fourth century. A lot of these practices were actually started in Judaism, in the mystic traditions of Judaism, that these are the prayer practices of Jesus. These are the prayer practices of Paul and the apostles. Uh, that Jesus, or that Paul, a lot of scholars believe that, you know, Paul's vision on the Damascus road is actually him uh, meditating on Ezekiel. Um, and in spending that time in meditation, he he works his way up looking at, uh, the throne and sees the face of Jesus. And that's when Jesus speaks to him and says, why are you persecuting me? And so, you know, there, there's a lot of glimpses of these uh, meditation practices all throughout scripture. So this is not something that was developed later, but it's part of the Jewish tradition handed down to us through the church and through the apostles. But the way of the heart, it's short. Um, it's in three sections on solitude, silence, and prayer. And it's about 90 pages long. And I think you should read it once a year. Uh, and he writes in a way that makes you want to do it. It's, it's just a good, it's a good book. Eugene Peterson has a book uh, called Eat This Book, and it's kind of going on the imagery of, um, I think, Ezekiel being told to eat, uh, eat this book and I think Revelation. Um, but what does it mean to ingest scripture, to take it in? The imagery of eating scripture is to chew it, to taste it, to swallow it, to be nourished by it. And he, he writes in a way, it's, it's a good book that encourages um, the, the art of spiritual reading of scripture. Uh, Ruth Haley Barton, uh, who I quoted earlier, she's got two great books I'm going to mention. Uh, the Invitation to Solitude and Silence is a great book. And then there's a book called Sacred Rhythms that kind of helps you develop uh, this, 
this internal, this internal uh, spirituality to be developed. Uh, the reason I bring all this up uh, is not to say, okay, let's just ignore Bible reading or ignore uh, relational experiences with Jesus or to ignore kingdom work. But I believe this is foundational that if we're going to be the people God has called us to be, we need to continue to go back into the presence of God to be shaped by him, uh, to develop a longing that moves beyond the superficial, that that takes us into a place of continual contemplation. Uh, one of the things I, I love about a lot of my, my reading in, in this spirituality is all of the great, what are called great spiritual masters, people who have really developed um, habits for this type of life, they all consider themselves beginners because we're all continually beginning again in a relationship with God and to coming back to the basics, to coming back to what does it mean to just know and love God. And the way Paul um, addresses this in a lot of his writings is uh, there, there are times when Paul's writing that he says stuff like, you need to be holy as God is holy. Um, actually, that's in Peter, but you know, Paul, Paul echoes that, says, be like Christ. And you're like, yeah, but he's God in the flesh. And so Paul may say something then like, okay, well, be like me as I'm like Christ. And you're like, well, man, but Paul, you're, you're an apostle. You are Paul. And so he then says, be like Timothy. Uh, he's, one of, he's one of you. Follow Timothy's example in the faith. And so part of what we do in this is we, we identify people who are doing this well. And we look at the way that they're like Christ. And we, we say, okay, let's begin, let's begin again. Because sometimes we look at the spiritual giants of the faith and we say, I can never be like that. And it's almost like looking at an Olympian and saying, I will never run as fast as them. But what we do is we just start running. We learn to run. And in learning to run, we get faster, our muscles develop, and we start longing to run. And so developing this type of spiritual life will actually take you into a deeper relationship with God that that brings even more fulfillment to the other areas of spiritual formation. So we'll talk more about this next week and what it means for a community of faith who does this together.